The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, once again, we're going to step outside of Africa for our show today and look at a different part of the world to see if there are lessons that Africans can draw from the experience with China. And we're going to go to Latin America and the Caribbean, LAC. And uh, this is a particularly interesting part of the world to look at, and I think there are a lot of parallels with what's happening in Africa. Now, a lot of people are actually surprised when they hear that China does more trade with Latin America, South America, and the Caribbean than Africa, by a lot, actually. Uh, Keep in mind that last year, in 2018, China did about $204 billion of trade uh, with Africa, the number in the in the Latin America, South America, uh, is somewhere around 260 billion and going up. Whereas from 2014-15, trade with Africa has been on a decline and rebounded in 2018. So that's very very interesting. Also, keep in mind that uh, the Chinese finance to the region was more than any of the World Bank, the Inter Inter American Development Bank combined, and that's very very interesting. And the policy banks in Beijing have become the largest annual public creditors to Latin American and South American countries. And now more and more, and this is just absolutely fascinating when you think about Latin and South America's history with the United States, more and more countries in the region have their primary trading relationship with China and not the United States. And that is just absolutely mind-boggling. So, Cobus, this is a relationship That is much bigger than I think a lot of people who focus on the Sino-African relationship understand. And I think that when we're going to, in our discussion today, we're going to be able to draw out a lot of lessons and parallels about what's happening in this part of the world compared to what's happening in Africa. Yes, there's definitely a lot of lessons to learn. Um, So as you mentioned, the the China-Latin America relationship is bigger um, than than the China Africa relationship, but there are lots of features in common um, and lots of of similar issues um, in the relationship as we see in the China Africa relationship. Those relate to trade. It relates to the role of raw commodities. Um, it relates to the role of communication um, and and kind of rumors and miscommunication about China, you know, c- circulating through Latin American communities. And so I think I think there's a lot to learn that Africa can learn from how this much larger relationship is being handled. It's interesting you bring up that trade issue because the the export profile from the Americas is very similar to what Africans are trading. So the majority of exports from Latin America, especially South American commodity producing countries, uh, have been concentrated in three areas, soybeans, uh, metal and ores, and then oil, uh, with about 50% of total exports actually in copper, iron, and soy. And remember, uh, we talked a couple weeks ago, Cobus, about African exports, and it was basically timber, iron ore, and minerals. So that accounted for somewhere north of 50 to 60 percent of exports from Africa to China. So there is a parallels, as you rightly pointed out, in the exporting profile between the two regions. So again, I think there's going to be a lot to dive into here, and we're really thrilled to have an expert on the region, and really someone who is just down the street from me here in Shanghai, Uh, Santiago Bustelo is a PhD candidate uh, at Fudan University, which is one of the more prestigious universities here in China, uh, doing his doctorate on China-South America relations. And we are thrilled to have you on the program for the first time. A very good evening, Santiago. Hi, Eric. Hi, Kobus. Uh, It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, it's really great to have you on. And uh, so let's kind of start. And I was reading the paper that you wrote uh, for it's uh, it was called a strategic agenda for the Sino-South American relationship under China's new normal, and you wrote this with your partner Marcus Reis uh, at, in the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University. And very early on in the paper, you quoted a scholar uh, 
who divided the relationship that South American and Latin American countries have with China into three categories. And I think this would be very instructive for Africa in part because in Africa, we don't have this delineation between the different countries and their relationship with China. So could you kind of walk through those three categories and explain how countries align in one category compared to another? Yes, of course. Well, the background vision that I have about how China impacts indeed Latin America is the idea that, I mean, the rapid growth of China in some kind of way is shaping the, the heavy trends in the in the world economy. So in some kind of sense, I, I believe that China is not the appearance of just a new competitor, but it's a kind of a game changer in the globalizing logic. So this places a challenge because now you have new trends in the world economy and, and countries are affected uh, differently. So some countries, as you mentioned, in Latin America have been largely benefit because why? They were uh, mainly uh, commodity producers. And as we know, uh, China is a big consumer of this kind of product. So the commodity boom that started in the 2000s and I kind of uh, faded in 2014 indeed uh, benefit them in, in several ways and mainly through surpluses in the in the trade balance now you have other kinds of countries like uh, argentina or brazil yes these are countries that are both commodity producers, but they also have some kind of manufacturing base that was mainly developed through the industrialization by sub substitution uh, years. And these kind of countries have more uh, mixed picture, you can say, because in one side, they're also benefited by the commodity boom and they're coming, so having a big uh, amount of capital uh, coming through trade. But at the same time, the Chinese imports, mainly composed of manufactured products, are threatening uh, big part of the domestic industry. So these countries kind of face a double, double challenge. Uh, and you have countries like mainly the ones in Central America, I would say Mexico, for example, which are not particularly big commodity producers. And they are kind of uh, very, uh, I mean, specialized in some kind of manufacture that it's also, I mean, based on assembling products. And these countries are basically getting the worst part indeed because they are just facing the competition of Chinese imports, very competitive indeed, but not having the, the commodity base or the natural resources uh, to counteract uh, these trends. So this is kind of the, the mixed picture. The last thing I want to say about this is that indeed this, this new shape that I mean the world economy is, is getting uh, as a consequence of China rise. Indeed, I think that it places the challenges for countries to reposition themselves and to change indeed the, the way they they have this developmental strategy, you know. It's very interesting that, you know, there's this um, three, you know, type breakdown of, of, of countries in relation to, to China. And I think you can probably, it'll be very interesting to see if it's possible to do a similar kind of breakdown in, in, in Africa. I can imagine, you know, countries that, that have, countries like Zambia, for example, where a single commodity really dominates their, their trade with China, um, com compared to countries that, like South Africa, which has a lot of extraction and selling a lot of commodities, but also do quite a lot of other business with China. And then a country like Rwanda, you know, that doesn't particularly have a lot of, a lot of commodities to sell and are trying to, to kind of do business with China in, in particular ways. I guess the, the question, um, I'd like to ask you is in, in some cases, the countries that in, in Africa that have started to focus on, on manufacturing and assembly, um, a lot of them are actually manufacturing and, and assembling Chinese products. You know, kind of there's, there's some Chinese in, investment in, in manufacturing and assembly in places like South Africa. Um, and then the, those products frequently go on to be sold to African consumers. Um, do, are you seeing the same kind of uh, investment into manufacturing assembly and then selling to domestic markets in Latin America as well? Yes, yes. So this is very interesting. Taking, for example, the case of Brazil, which is a country that, despite having a, a natural resource base and, and it's a big exporter of commodity, it's also a kind of pretty good industrialized country. And Chinese investment there at the beginning was mainly concentrated in natural resources. But you can see since the 2010, 
12, 13, that indeed many manufacturing uh, firms start to arrive, like Huawei, many, many, Huawei indeed was before, but many uh, car producers like Cherry and different uh, constructing firms that also are establishing some kind of manufacturing base. So I think that in, in, in Argentina, we have also this case. So yes, of course, because uh, I think for Chinese firms, this is also an important way to gain uh, domestic markets. So you can see that indeed uh, Chinese investments, it's uh, pretty diversified and it's indeed uh, arriving to, to the manufacturing sector. Yes. So it's coming to the manufacturing center and the Chinese presence in Latin America, Caribbean is going up quite a bit. In Africa, there's oftentimes a very awkward relationship that many countries have with China. On the one hand, they're very grateful for the amount of infrastructure financing and the, the, the financing in general that's coming and the investment and the trade. And those are all very, very good things. But then there are the environmental issues, corruption, transparency. There's a whole bunch of other issues that make the assimilation between China and Africa very, very challenging at times. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the relationship in South America and Latin America, about how Chinese state-owned enterprises are operating. I know that there have been some issues in Peruvian mines over the years where Chinese uh, companies, mining companies, were having some labor issues and whatnot. Uh, Huawei was really featured very prominently uh, by the New York Times and for exporting surveillance technology to Ecuador and other, and other technology companies providing surveillance equipment to Ecuador. And so that's made some people nervous. Give us a little bit of an overview of the, the broader relationship and where it's easy, but also where it's difficult. Yes, uh, of course. Well, as China's presence increases uh, in the continent, of course, new challenges arise. And the case you mentioned, for example, regarding environmental and the relation of Chinese uh, firms with local communities, it's, it's a big challenge. The case of Peru is, is one of the most famous, but also in, in I would say that almost in any big infrastructure uh, uh, project that China is is pushing forward in the continent, there is always some kind of local resistance. And in this sense, I do believe that Chinese firms, despite they might have in some kind of learning process, they are still not very good in interacting with, with local communities and maybe also with, with local regulation. And indeed, this is a very uh, big problem. However, there are also other types of challenges. As I mentioned, uh, many manufacturing industries are being affected. So also politically, there are many sectors in, in Brazil or Argentina that kind of oppose uh, the presence of China in these countries. Uh, these are one of the means. There is also voices uh, regarding Chinese financing and the, the, the sustainability of this and also the, the kind of debt-trapped uh, diplomacy problem that now is uh, very fashion. Uh, so yes, the challenges are, are, are indeed uh, very big. And I think that they're also kind of common with the Africa's ones. Um, you mentioned the, the narrative of debt trap diplomacy. Um, recently, we've heard, uh, you know, some, I think it was Mike Pompeo, I think, um, saying that um, that recommitting the U.S. to the idea that that the Western Hemisphere is essentially its domain. So, if I understand it correctly, you know, it's kind of like recommitting to the Monroe Doctrine. Um, you know, the, the, we've seen a lot of comments coming out of Washington about China's uh, growing influence in Africa, but so far, they've, I, to my mind, they've they seemed relatively muted about China's, you know, growing influence in their own backyard, essentially. No, in, in, I, I don't think that's the case. Go ahead, I think go ahead. They, yeah, no, I, uh, let me just step in there. I mean, they've been very vocal and very concerned about Chinese intervention in, uh, or financial intervention in South America, particularly now focused on Venezuela. Yeah, focusing on uh, Mike, Venezuela, yeah. Mike Pompeo and the White House have really gone after the Chinese for supporting the Maduro government in Venezuela. Uh, they are also kind of talking about how China's spreading what they call their tentacles throughout uh, Latin and South America. So it is, it is definitely creeping up. Rex Tillerson, in fact, a couple years ago, before he started using the debt trap diplomacy line in Africa, it was actually a reference for Latin and South America. So this is really, you know, the I didn't States, realize that. It's yeah, very, very and the United oh, okay. States has always had uh, 
this very paternalistic, possessive relationship with Latin and South America, much like Europe has long had with Africa. So they do feel it's an incursion into their uh, sphere of influence, and also in the Caribbean as well, where the Chinese have made a lot of inroads, and Belt and Road countries are also starting to to gain traction there. Uh, Santiago, what's your take on on, on Cobus's point there? Well, you all the things you mentioned are pretty correct indeed. So the United States position in, in the last years, particularly since the Trump administration uh, took power, it's clearly uh, reassessing its its role in Latin America and, and I mean, counteracting uh, Chinese presence. And you mentioned how Tylerson, Pompeo and, and many officers warn about the predatory practice of China's. And indeed, I think that as the geopolitical uh, dispute between the US and China intensifies this also has impacts in Latin America. So I think that despite this uh, position of the United States, indeed, I don't see that they are being very able in order to stop uh, national governments to engage uh, with China. And it's very interesting to see that, for example, in the last years, many we can call right-wing governments to power in Latin America after some a period of left governance. So in Brazil, you have Bolsonaro. In Argentina, you have Macri. And in Chile, you have Piñera. And all of these were very critical of how China engaged in the 2000s uh, with China. And they said, no, we cannot sell ourselves to China and, and this kind of things. But ironically, when they arrived to power, because of the importance of Chinese uh, investment, trade, and, 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 and financing, they adopted a very pragmatical approach. And despite the, the, the warnings of the US, I do believe that even these countries that are more aligned with, with, with the United States positions, ideologically and politically, they are anyway like deepening the, the relation or at least not stopping it. Jacobus, that sounds a lot like former Zambian president, the late president, Michael Sada, who, when he was the opposition leader, was the most strident anti-China critic out there. And then he when he came to power uh, was I think his first overseas trip was to Beijing. And so it's interesting how that parallel kind of repeats itself there. Uh, Santiago, one of the defining kind of memes and themes of the China-Africa relationship is this issue of China colonizing Africa, neo-colonialism. In fact, Fox News just ran uh, an op-ed from a Nigerian businessman recently where it said this is the new neo-colonialism. And it is this ongoing theme in how people both in Africa and outside of Africa interpret foreign players like the Chinese. Now, Central America and South America were colonized just as much as any African country was uh, by the Span- by the Spanish and by the Portuguese. So, uh, but I'm curious: is there that same concern about neo-colonialism from the Chinese? Obviously, there's been that relationship with the Americans for a long time, but from the Chinese, do they have those concerns about colonialism? And is there a similar meme that is in Africa? Yes, I think that. There is another kind of language that express maybe similar concerns. So in Latin America, you can hear more warnings related to center periphery or the new dependency uh, with China, which is more related to the to the country's own to, to Latin America's own uh, experience regarding developing and its own development process. So you can see this idea that we are repeating this pattern of certain periphery trade where we sell natural resources and we buy manufactured products and we are reprimarizing our, our, our production base uh, and this and deindustrialization. But the word colonization or neocolonialism it's, I would say it's not really part of, of the debate. Another another grouping or another kind of geopolitical configuration that that used to be very fashionable and everyone mentioned it and as now I mean it's still around but it's not it's not the flavor of the month is BRICS um, you know Brazil Russia India China and South Africa um, to which extent do you feel BRICS as a group is still relevant, particularly in the Brazil-China relationship? Or is it most, should we mostly think of it just as a bilateral relationship? Well, with the new administration in the case of Brazil, I think they kind of lost some relevance. You know, this is a new administration which is very right-wing and very ideological, despite it denies it. It's very ideological. It's foreign policy and they are pragmatical with China, but 
kind of not very interested in in, in building these bricks and all all these things. However, this year the the summit will be in Brazil, and the president commit to to organize it. And I think I mean they won't stop it or, or whatever, but it won't be a priority in my opinion. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa Channel Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. One of the themes that we've been talking about over the past few months in the China-Africa relationship is the relationship that African countries have with the United States and the Trump administration in particular. It's been a bumpy ride with the Trump administration for the past couple of years. Uh, who can forget Nambia, asshole, uh, the stripping of AGOA, uh, trade privileges from Rwanda, the, the steel tariffs on uh, on, Africa, on South African aluminum and steel exports and whatnot. So that, that's been a very difficult relationship. But then there's been this kind of turnaround since last, say, November, December, when John Bolton announced the new Prosper Africa strategy. There's the also the new Overseas Private Investment Corporation that is starting to ramp up and give loans in Africa. So the United States does seem to be engaging in Africa. At the same time, in the Americas, uh, it looks like the Trump administration is becoming increasingly hostile to Central American countries. Uh, and in fact, over the past few months, uh, the, the administration said they were going to cut aid to a number of different countries, including El Salvador and Honduras. Uh, yeah, El, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua, if, I, if I'm recalling. Two of those three countries have relationship with Taiwan. So that inserts them right into the China-Taiwan mix. And I'm curious to see if the pressure that these Latin American and South American countries are getting from the Trump administration, mostly Latin American, will start to push these countries to align themselves more with China as they just don't see their economic fortunes tied to the, the United States and see more opportunity with China. And in particular, those two countries that are uh, currently have diplomatic relations with Taiwan, I kind of immediately saw that China is going to whip out the giant checkbook, drop an enormous amount of money on these countries and say, listen, if you switch your affiliation from Taipei to Beijing, we'll give you not only the recognition and the trade, but a huge amount of money. Love to get your take on the politics between China, Latin America, as it relates to the United States. Yes, well, it goes back to, to a little bit the previous issue. You know, the United States is indeed reassessing its presence in the region, but I think that it's doing mainly with sticks, indeed, with, with threats and, and warnings and, and certain kind of hostility or, or, or measures that are against uh, the interests of, of Latin American countries in some cases. And I think that they are not putting enough uh, emphasis in the in the carrots I was in the benefits in, in in doing some kind of propositive issues like building infrastructure or, or financing or investing that will gather the support so regarding to your question I think that it's possible that one of the effects of, of this position of the United States paradoxically is that some countries will kind of end up approaching China because Despite the political aspect, there is some structural issues. That is, you know, the, the, the presence, the importance that China gained for Latin America in the last decade is very difficult to avoid for, for countries. So I do believe that uh, it could happen. And on the other side, China, despite the fallacies and the contradictions in terms of trust building and explaining what's their true interest in the region and, and these things that also I think it happens in Africa. They are also very effective in, in gathering political support, in, 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 in financing, investing and doing political summits. The Chinese leaders travel to Latin America very often and, and they're pretty cautious and they, they care pretty much of of, of having the support or at least to 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 have some kind of political dense relationship. 
So it's it's possible. And in the case of Taiwan, they I, I do believe that this is more related to China's Taiwan relations. But I think that in the last years there was some kind of offensive from China to 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 reduce uh, the countries that recognize uh, Taiwan. And in Latin America, this was very clear because uh, several countries like Panama uh, turned around in the last uh, years and started to recognize China. So it it could indeed uh, happen still more this 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 uh, process. You raise an interesting two two issues separately that that uh, I it, you know they 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 go interestingly together. Um, on the one hand, you you mentioned that you feel that in you know kind of global politics, China is kind of a game changer. You know, they're not simply another kind of rich country trading in the same way as other countries that they tend to they're like they're changing the entire system in some kind of way but at the same time you also mentioned that south american countries um sometimes worry that they that they are essentially going backwards you know kind of that they that they're being pushed back into this center periphery um paradigm you know where they are essentially being pushed back into an older an older model of their own economy you know kind of where they they're only selling raw materials, you know, or the, 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 the economy is kind of being reduced back to this almost 20th century model. And I think a lot of a very similar worries are, you, you, you hear that a lot in Africa, that oh, we're, being, we're being pushed back into this old, old thing that we're trying to get rid of. We, you know, China ends up kind of pushing us back in that direction. Um, how do you feel those two go together? Like, you know, is, when, if China is really a game changer, which I tend to also think, is that what game is being changed? You know, kind of is is there a way for for these countries to to actually jump into another another section of the economy that actually is better for them economically and developmentally? Or does that game change necessarily mean that they are gonna that we that a lot of these countries are actually going backwards? Yes, great. So I do believe that it is a game changer. I do believe that the rise of China, or at least the rapid economic growth and development, to put it with another vocabulary, indeed changed the globalizing logic and how the world economy functions and, and the heavy trends that shape this. So Latin America already went to a process relatively similar of this in the beginning of the 20th century when, you know, the center of the global economy passed from England or the United Kingdom to the United States, yes? So this transition in that moment in Latin America was very well perceived by economists called Raoul Prebisch, which perceived that indeed this changing of the epicenter of the global economy from a country that it's UK, a manufacturer producer and a raw materials importer, to another one that it's a manufacturer producer but also uh, a commodity producer and exporter, it would imply that Latin America will have to change its development strategy and uh, start an industrializing process. Yes, so there was a very complex theory, but very accurate. So I think today, maybe we can see a process similar where we are see- seeing that, you know, the center of the global economy is mainly transitioning to Asia. Uh, and mainly China. And this, I do believe that in place that Latin American countries have to strategically reposition themselves and change their development strategy in order to, you know, have a new way of participation in the global economy. Now, what is the path? That's very difficult and it will have to be adapted to the national conditions. I do believe that natural resources is necessary. It's not necessarily a course. I, I don't agree with this. Also, it's true that the manufacturing sector in many countries will have to be rethink and reshape and, and, and maybe there has to be some kind of selective strategy that protects some sectors, but also fosters the ones that have more uh, competitive advantages. So it's, it's a very complex issue. But I do believe that there are maneuver margins. I do believe that it's possible to, 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 to have some kind of strategy in order to, to, to gather the, the, the positive effects of this, uh, we can say, tectonic uh, change. Interesting. I'd like to close our discussion uh, on a personal note, and just to ask you a personal question about what it's like to be here in China, here in Shanghai, to study uh, China-South America relations. And the reason I ask is because at least people in China are starting to build some awareness of Africa. You see in the subways, there are advertisements for safaris, there are anti-ivory messages, 
uh, with the FOCAC summits that are every three years as the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summits. That gets a lot of official propaganda news. And Africa is not as foreign a subject as it used to be, not to mention the fact that Wolf Warrior 2, China Salesman, these huge blockbuster movies now are being set in Africa. Uh, and people are talking about it. And Africa, in many ways, is a point of pride for a lot of Chinese foreign policy, whether it's on the UN peacekeeping missions that Chinese our soldiers are doing, or it's Huawei and what they're doing. And it's held up a lot. And people, you talk about Africa, they go, oh, I know that. I had, and I'm not joking today with you, I told some of my colleagues at work today that I was going to speak with you. And they said, oh, Latin America, that's where tacos come from. <laughs> And there's two Taco Bells here in Shanghai. And then right now there's also a promotion going on by Kentucky Fried Chicken KFC for the new fried chicken taco uh, sandwich that they have. And I'm uh, the point I'm making about this is that's what people identify with Latin and South America is Mexican taco. And so there's really not much knowledge at all about anything in this part of the world that I've seen very much. And I'm curious what it's like for you, both as someone from that part of the world who's here and studying here, what it's like to live in China and Shanghai and uh, and what your experiences are studying on campus. Well, that's a complex, but very interesting question. Well, it's true. I mean, Latin America is not many times part of the radar and as tacos and football, maybe. Uh, so indeed, uh, I don't personally expect too much of, of the knowing about our, our countries and cultures. And indeed, this for the Chinese students, our, our friends that I, I generally talk with, Latin America is some kind of very nebulous whole thing together. All the countries mix up. There's no difference. And like it's kind of very imaginary. So, yes, from that point of view, I, I do believe that... Uh, still a lot to do. Uh, and there's also not many Latin American here. I, I think that China's relations with Africa is a little bit, has more history in that sense. And, and, and also geographically, it's a little bit closer. So that, that also helps. But my experience is very good. I, I must say that I, I enjoy pretty much life here and, and, and I'm learning uh, interesting things in the university and, and, and about China. So I think it's, it's, it's a good experience. It's, it's very enlightening uh, also to understand Latin America. And can you get good food here? In Shanghai, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let from yes, Mexican food is good. Mexican and there food is, is excellent here, by the way. Yes, Mexican there, food truly yeah, is yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing. And we're not there, just talking Taco Bell. No, there are many, many options. Also, they have, there's one Argentine and there's a couple of of, of Brazilian uh, restaurants and bars. So that point is not that difficult. And you know, today with Taobao, you can all access all the all the products it, it's really incredible but but they are there you can see the the candies that you miss and this this kind of things you, you can buy them on on Taobao so it's not that 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 difficult and Taobao of course is the online shopping marketplace that literally sells everything and it's really just when you leave China and you just miss Taobao it's just it, yeah it just becomes a big part of your life so uh Listen, Santiago, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Santiago Bustelo is a PhD candidate right here in Shanghai at Fudan University studying South American, Latin America and relations with China. Uh, if you are interested in following this topic, and I know a lot of people have emailed me over the years asking for information about that. In fact, several people have asked us, uh, Kobus and I, that we should start up a China Americas project, and there's that much interest in it. Uh, so one day we, when we have the time, we would actually like to do that. But I do recommend that everybody go to dialogochino.net. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, that's an excellent resource on China, Latin America, South America relations. Santiago, do you have any other suggestions on sources of English language information where people can go to, to find out more about this topic? Well, in English, there are some places for data about Chinese financing. The Inter-American Dialogue has a good uh, database. And then you have uh, 
China, well, the, the one you mentioned is, is also very interesting. I personally, for the Portuguese speakers, I have a Radar China, which is a website that we also uh, post and write and invite people to write about China, Sino-Latin American relationships. So I think uh, there's more and more uh, vehicles and press and, and, and portals uh, about this, this relationship. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We wish you the best of luck with your PhD program. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Cobus. And it was really a pleasure to participate in this podcast. I also, I am a very frequent listener of this. So it was, it's very, very nice for me. Oh, well, we're honored and we love the fact that we're cross-pollinating China, Latin America and China, Africa relations. So thank you for listening. And uh, we really appreciate your time today. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cobus, the most important takeaway that I have from listening to what Santiago was saying about the China-South America-Latin America relationship is the, the magnitude and the scale. There are so many parallels with what's happening in Africa. And I think it would behoove African policymakers to start studying how Latin American and South American leaders are also engaging the Chinese because there are lessons that can be drawn here. The other thing that's important, I think, to remember is that so much of the China-Africa debate in Africa tends to focus on a very kind of, I don't know how to say it's selfish or it's about us and this idea that China needs Africa. Most of what China's buying in Africa, China can buy from South and Central America. That's just the reality. When, I mean, forget, you know, let's talk about not the strategic minerals in the DRC, that's exceptional, but the gold, the timber, the oil, those are commodities. And by definition, they can be bought elsewhere. And I think when we look at the China-Africa relationship, so much of it began in the early 2000s when China had not formulated the relationship in places like Central and South America, in Southeast Asia, and in Central Asia, many of the points along the Belt and Road. But today, that's not the case. And a certain degree of humility might be worthwhile on the part of some African leaders and some policymakers in terms of how they engage, or at least in the dialogue. And again, I'm not Talking, of, I mean, African countries must stand up, they must become better negotiators, but they also have to recognize that you have to compete for China's business because China has choices now. So in my mind, that means you have to create a better business climate, improve governance, reduce corruption, improve the infrastructure, improve education of the labor force, all of those basic things in order to attract not just Chinese foreign investors, but foreign investors from all over the world. Because at the end of the day, this is a global economy. And if you're only selling something that somebody else sells, then it becomes more difficult to compete. And I think what we heard today was that Latin America and South America are in some ways out-competing Africa given the trade volumes. Yeah, it does certainly look like that. And yeah, I agree with you that that it's really it's really important to be very strategic um, about how you position yourself um, and to try and add value to everything you have. You know, so so if you already have resources, then try try and add add local you know knowledge or training to to your population at the same time. I guess you know the the difficulty of that is is a you know where does the money come from um but then also i think in you know kind of setting a kind of a national culture where this kind of strategic forward planning becomes part of the job of the state um and i think you know that africa has been not great with that um in you know it is in, in a lot of countries um and you know, it'll be interesting to compare not only with South America, but also to places like Southeast Asia, you know, who does who does a lot more business with, with China to see how how the that kind of national domestic forward planning is actually done and how it's implemented. Um, you know, and, and and what Africa can actually learn from from the way that a place like Malaysia, for example, is 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 preparing itself for what business with China is going to be like in twenty years. And for those of you following the debt trap diplomacy debate uh, that's going on, really, Venezuela is ground zero for this around the world. The Chinese have extended over the years some $60 billion. I think there's about between 20 and $30 billion that is still outstanding from Venezuela. Uh, it is in the midst of a massive political turmoil. This would be an opportunity if China wanted to go in and to grab assets or to uh, extract more concessions uh, on the oil side. This would be the time for them to do it when the Maduro government is weak. 
Uh, at this point, it does not seem like they are leveraging that position. So as we talk about the debt trap debate in Africa, uh, really, we should be also be looking at what's happening in Venezuela to see what the Chinese actions are and then base our conclusions as to whether or not China is behaving in a predatory nature based on the facts as actually they happen, not on fears or on su supposition that this may happen. But we got to watch what's actually happening on the ground. And Venezuela is a very, very interesting and important case study in that, in part because also from what we understand from scholars like Matt Furchin, who was at Carnegie Chinhua, who was also a China-Venezuela scholar, he was saying that what happened in Venezuela with the amount of loans that they extended really kind of scared the Chinese in terms of extending as many loans in places like Africa. So it's, it really contributed to the more risk-averse nature of Chinese lending in other parts of the world. Again, why it's interesting for people to step out of the bubble and to look at different parts of the world. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. If you have any comments and questions, we would love to hear from you. Uh, go ahead and email Kobus and I directly. You And we're getting back to people within 24 hours usually. Eric at ChinaAfricaProject.com or Kobus at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Of course, there's all of our social media channels that you can reach us on as well. We'll give you the information at that at the end of the program. And also, we want to give a shout out for our weekly email newsletter that goes out every Monday. Uh, it's really a, a, just a great summary of the week's news of what's of the top five or six stories that Cobus and I pick out. We also put in a long read in there as well, but it's just a nice selection. So if you'd like to get that, just head over to our website at ChinaAfricaProject.com and there's signups all over the website there. We would love to have you part of that community as well. So we'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.